seeing the people who are on the zoom you can look at it how <laughs> it's it's really up to you <laughs> actually my understanding is it's like this incredibly wide angle oh, it so is so it is really a like, like a 360 view camera so really? if somebody talks it'll pick them up and it does get the whole audience it gets me it gets you guys it's and, and it's a speaker as well yes so we'll hear the questions. You will time. when I unmute people. <laughs> okay, you have the power. Yes, I do have the power right now. Um, but yeah, I think that will. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, we're really excited about both being here. And um... <laughs> we're excited about being here. Thanks for coming back. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we we, we we had it. spoken before about who's going to go first and make make introductions. And clearly, it's not going as smoothly as we thought it would. Um, so I'll I'll continue. Um, thanks for coming out this evening. I'm I'm thrilled to be here with all of you, and with Leslie and all of you who are out there on the Zoom. Um, I. Uh, I drank coffee before we left home. And so as a, you know, consequently what's gonna happen is I'm gonna talk for about the next 48 minutes, <laughs> probably not saying much. Um, anyway, my name is Hawk Henry, so that's probably you're aware. Uh, I'm a flute maker, have been a, a maker of uh, native flutes. I generally call them flutes. Um, and that could be a whole uh, a different discussion, but. Um, I've been a, a flute maker for the past uh, 31 plus years. My, um, uh, I, I learned how to build flutes quite by mistake. It, it was never intention uh, and intention. My family gifted my first flute to me. And after a month or so of, um, of playing it, I somehow thought that I could improve the voice of this flute and not knowing how they operate, how they work. I uh, found some tools and uh, ruined it. Uh, in, about, in about five minutes time, the flute went from playing very sweetly to not playing at all, which may have been okay for my family since I didn't really know how to play. Um, but then, uh, you know, I was a bit discouraged uh, in the beginning, but then determined to make the flute work again, uh, knowing that I, I wouldn't get another. Um, so for the next six months, I worked at reconstructing that flute uh, and um, re what resulted is uh, I gathered knowledge about how this type of instrument works and eventually applied it to new materials and started building flutes. Um, so that's a, a, a little bit about my experience. As I mentioned, that it's been a little more than 31 years uh, and probably for the last 26 or so years, uh, it's been as a full-time flute maker and flute player, which is why I've lost so much weight. <laughs> oh, bad joke, so don't, you know. I've always thought if I didn't make it as a flute player or a flute maker, I would uh, be a comedian. Um, so um, this, this flute that I play, I mentioned, I, I generally refer to them as native flutes um, or actually just as flutes, and other people think of them as Native American flutes or as courting flutes or as love flutes. There's a lot of story um, behind this instrument. Uh, and you know, if you're curious, I'm, I'm happy to share what I know about it. Um, simply, uh, the instrument itself is a two-chambered 
a two-chambered end-blown block flute. It's about a thousand years old, um, and it has been used in, um, oh, I would say, uh, I was going to speak about percentages, but I can't really do that. But um, a, a lot of Native peoples on this continent have this flute in one form or another. <laughs> um, so I mentioned two-chambered end-blown block flute. The mouthpiece end here begins the first chamber, right about where this piece of leather um, is, uh, there's a solid wall. So it's hollow from here to the solid wall. And then um, from that wall forward, it's hollow again. The piece that's tied at the top is called a, a bird or a bridge or a block or a saddle. And its job is to take your breath, which comes out of a hole right below it, um, and it guides it forward to another hole right in front of that wall. And at that wall, uh, um, at that second hole, the air um, stream splits. What goes into the flute speeds up in vibration and makes a sound. The rest of it goes back out into space so we can rebreathe it. Um, and that's the, the basic premise of how this flute works. Um, the six finger holes and... So opening all the finger holes for the most part gives you the highest pitch unless you overblow and closing all the holes, which lengthens that um, column of vibrating air and gives you the, the lowest pitch that the flute will make. Um, of course, there's, there's much more to it and I'll stop for now and invite Leslie to <laughs> share some of what she does. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That was, that was great. So I've been making the students kind of as long. Um, my, you know, story is a little bit, you know, I'm allowed to take my bassoon home for the first time from high school. I've been playing in the band room for a week. And the first thing I do is I strip it of all the keys um, and then end up actually having to stay home the next day to put it back together because I stripped it with great confidence, just a pile on the table, and it didn't quite go back together as easily as I thought it would. So I, I um, and then from then on, even though I promised not to do this again, of course I did continue to do it, um, but I did it a lot more methodically until I could figure out how to um, put it back together with all the keys in the jungle. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I played bassoon, um, uh, yeah, starting in high school. And then at some point also just really got involved with early music. And it was a period of time when there was a lot still, it was very much a, a, a very exploratory um, world in early music where people were just really like um, uncovering treatises and, and going back to museums and looking at instruments. And so, it was very much a, a hands-on um, self-taught, so I wasn't the only one. There, this was happening. Um, this was happening, you know, certainly all, all over this continent and, and throughout Europe, um, both with recorders and oboes and bassoons and and, and of course any any string instrument. And um, yeah, so my 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 the reason I started making Baroque bassoons, even though it's, I don't really play them anymore, was because I was just so involved in early music at the time. And I started actually, the first instruments I made were recorders, mm -hmm. because a friend of mine was starting to make recorders, this was like when I was first, first couple of years in college in like you know, 78, 79. And um, he, was, he was turning recorders on a lathe and a friend's basement. And so, it was a little very much the same thing where you just started, um, you just started to, un, you know, started and just to see what it felt like to turn and to. Um. So the bassoon, um, double reed instrument, conical, um, it comes from the East originally in the form of a, the, the double, the double reed conical instrument. Um, was called a sham in Europe, and it, but it was imported if you want, or it, it traveled to Europe from, from the East. And there's like the instruments that still exist um, are Shanais and um, Zornas. Um, and one of the things that Europeans 
and this would have been like in the, in the Renaissance period. So there are a whole series of these double board, really wide conical instruments that were really loud, called shams was, was one common um, European name for it. But, and one of the things that the Europeans did with their instruments is they loved to make different sizes. Like, you know, that was like one of the first things that happened is like you had everything from soprano to great, great, great basses, just because of, you know, uh, the polyphonic um, and harmonic nature of, um, yeah, uh, European compositions. So the same thing happened with these shams. So these wide double bore instruments and you would have an eight foot and a 16 foot model of, of these that you would lug around. And somebody had, somebody, several people had this idea of like what happens if you kind of cut it in half and put it back on itself. Um, and that's basically the dulcian, this, this instrument. So this is like a really wide bore um, instrument that has two bores in it. So. Oh, another thing all, all bassoons have is the vocal. So there's like a place for the, the vocal to go. The bore gets wider and wider and wider all the way down. And then it comes back around the other side and gets wider and wider and wider until it opens up in the bell. And one, two things happened when, when this was done, when the instrument was kind of like folded back on itself. One is that it extended the range both higher. All of a sudden, you were able to get actually a second and a third octave and it extended the range a fourth lower because the bottom of the instrument, which used to be the bell, now you could actually put tone holes on. Um, so that was the Renaissance instrument. Um, the Baroque instrument is, is kind of like a, a whole different thing. That bore was narrow, the instruments lengthened a little bit, and two things happened. Oh, and one thing that happened with um, the dulcian is that it made the sound a lot softer compared to what the other bore, um, instruments were. And I do have some reads here. And then, and then you know, in, in the Baroque period, um, the first bassoon is actually probably dates from the 1680s, 1690s. Um, they coexisted for quite some time, the, the dulcines and the bassoons. Um, and in fact, in some places, in Spain most notably, um, the dulcines actually continued well into like the 20th century um, and developed on their own. But they, it was a dulcian and not a bassoon just because of that wide bore. And it has a great presence, like it's meaning it's loud, I guess. <laughs> 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 um, they're all double reeds. <laughs> so um, a rondo donax um, is the material. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll get into like, so, so, these instruments are all based on instruments that are either in private collections or in museums. And, um, you know, the first step is, of course, some reason to be drawn to a particular instrument. So they're replicas. They're replicas of these historical instruments. And, you know, but it's not without um, a lot of, there's a big puzzle, and there are lots of parts of the puzzle. And one of them is, is, of course, the vocals are missing on most of these original instruments. And the other thing is, like, what was the reed like? Um, so once you kind of decide on something that you want to make, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, puzzle work to try and figure out actually how to, how to get it to play. Um, but there's, there's always something in it that makes you think this is worthwhile. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's something. <laughs> it's got, you know, a tone or so, just a just, uh, sound of a broke bassoon. <laughs> like a reed can make. Um, same instrument. <laughs> uh, so how would you characterize the difference? I mean, I hear, I hear that reed as 
brighter. Brighter. It, it's brighter. It's also quick. It's it responsive. More responsive. Yeah. Um, it takes. Um, I'm sure it's the same thing when you go from flute to flute. Like the, there's a few minutes of adjustment sure. because, um, uh, like even the scale is a little bit different. So then once you figure out where to place it, you still have the same breadth of. Um, Yes, it's brighter, but actually, I'm, I'm kind of contradicting myself. It's brighter. This one's a little woodier, a little more muted, mm -hmm. but this one has a larger range of articulation mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. And the tone, you can actually do a lot once you get, you know, once you play with it a little bit. If you what you want to do is like subdue it a little bit, there are ways to do that mm -hmm. once you get comfortable with it. And once your instrument is warmed up, how does that affect the, what we hear, the voice of it? Um, well, there are two warms up. One we both know. One is the playing in warmed up, which is a process that takes sure, some time. time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, typically, if you're doing a concert or a presentation, will you play for a half an hour? Yeah, or an hour yes, and... you're, not just half an hour, maybe even half 15 minutes. Sure. And when an instrument is fully played in, which is the process we can sure. talk about, when an instrument is fully played in, that's all it. That's all it Absolutely. needs. And then again, if you put it aside for an hour and you pick it up again close enough to the time where you played it it's, it's okay it's ready to go yeah. yep yeah i mean maybe there's that um i don't know four seconds um, <laughs> 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 like getting, getting it sure sure <laughs> because there's the literal warming up of the instrument and your pitch goes up as the instrument it warms up and it goes yep. down if your instrument is cold So because I asked that question, Leslie has generously offered me the choice of any of her instruments <laughs> to bring home. I oh. just wanted you to know that. <laughs> but yeah, so then, then there's our, um, I don't know, we can talk, I mean, there's a couple of things. We can talk about just even very briefly, just the process of like going from a piece of wood to, you know, drilling cone holes, whatever. But then there's also just what we talked about just for a moment was just the, the tuning process. Right. And the playing in process. So I don't know if, if maybe you'd like to say a little bit about how, how you approach that. Which of those you things? Are, um, <laughs> I, I think, I think um, to, to give a, a, a little overview of my flute making process and the tools that I use, um, when I uh, first began building flutes, I worked with bamboo. Um, it was accessible, it was fairly hollow, I didn't need um, many tools to work with, uh, to, you know, to, to use. Um, I had no woodworking experience uh, prior to that, except for chopping firewood and stacking it. Um, uh, so bamboo was a, a really great material to work with. And once I got a little more confident in terms of um, uh, the skills that I had acquired, I thought I should apply this knowledge to wood but I had no idea um, what to do in order to make uh, the piece of wood hollow um, and then to shape it. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's a, a, a place in Hulls Cove called the Tool Barn. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. I went to the Tool Barn and uh, I said to the person who was working there, his name was Steve, um, he, he's left this world now, but I said, I need to accomplish this set of tasks in order to make a piece of wood hollow and turn it into a flute. Which tools do you suggest? And so we walked around the store together. Um, if you're not familiar with the Tubon, um, it's, it's a shop that um, sells refurbished hand tools. No electric anything in there in terms of the tools that they, that they sell. Um, so we walked around a little bit and he suggested that I, I get a, a brace and a bit uh, a draw knife and a block plane. And the brace in the bit is basically a long drill bit. The brace is the tool that's used, the device that holds the bit that allows you the, to then bore uh, the piece of wood. I actually didn't bring that with me. Um, the draw, uh, draw knife, as the name kind of implies, is a, a long blade that um, you use and to shape the wood. And uh, I'm still using the same one that I got from there. It was uh, kind of made at home someone's home. Um, this is an old file that was welded together and then shaped. These handles 
they come off and I put the cape on them and slam them on the ground to hold them together. Um, and, and I use my body as a bench. So pretend this is hollow. Um, I use the draw knife like this, always wearing a t-shirt so I know when to stop, so I don't get the wood red. Um, and I rough shape it, I turn it with my, with my knees. Um, and once it's got a rough shape, then I use a block plane. I use a block plane and I just spilled water on your rug, um, which is this device here to fine shape the, the, uh, the piece of wood. And that kind of gives me the, the basic shape of the flute. Um, yeah, I wish I had brought the, uh, the long bits. I bore in from one end to make the first chamber, and then I turned the wood around and bore from the other end to make the second chamber. Um, and that's uh, the basics of how um, I get the, the shape of the flute. I use copious amounts of sanding, um, you know, to, to uh, smooth out the, the rough piece of wood. Um, I use then, oh, I didn't bring those either, um, fire uh, to make all of the small sound holes, the mouth hole, uh, mouthpiece hole, and the two holes beneath the bird. And um, how I use the fire is, is simply I have uh, different sizes of uh, tapered files, metal files. I used to build a fire, literally, you know, go outside and, and make a fire on the ground and, and heat them up that way. And um, my wife's dad watched that one day and he said, you know, you should maybe just try a propane torch, which I thought was brilliant. And um, so uh, I, I did, you know, I, I'm still using, well, actually I use map gas now. I, I love working with hand tools, although I'm, I'm beginning to use some electric tools as well to kind of save my, my body, so I'm making two, two lines of flutes, um, uh, those that are strictly done with hand tools and then some using hand tools and electric tools. Um, the, the idea of, of hand tools, um, uh, using hand tools allows me mobility. It allows me to, to make flutes outside, um, you know, wherever it is that I, I'd like to be when I build them. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's what I, I'm, I'm, I'm purposefully not um, giving a whole lot of information. As I mentioned half jokingly before, I, I, I did have coffee, but um, I generally talk a lot. Um, and I, what I'd like to do more so is to, is to hear what your interests are. And I'm looking at the owl or those people on Zoom too, to hear what direction you'd like to go in terms of um, <coughs> your curiosity, what you'd like to know, so, yeah. So that's my little uh, explanation. Yes, please. I'm curious, what, what type of wood do you use? Uh, I use a variety of woods, um, primarily um, local yeah. and, and domestic, so even woods that, you know, grow here on this continent but don't live here uh, in this part of it. Um, I, I also use woods that people give to me, which sometimes they're not domestic or local woods. Um, this piece here is uh, Eastern Red Cedar. Um, I have, uh, let's see, Red Flame Box Elder, Cedar, Black Walnut, um, different types of cedars, I should say. Uh, Northern White Cedar, as I mentioned, Eastern Red Cedar, which is a, actually a juniper. Um, pine, elderberry, green striped maple or moose maple. Uh, I've made flutes from sunflower stalks and burdock <laughs> and Japanese knotweed and bone, um, you know, different kinds of bones as well. Um, traditionally, historically, uh, flutes made from bones and uh, the woods that grew, you know, where you lived were the, the primary source of materials for for the instruments. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about hole size and spacing and bore. Sure. What specifically would you like to know? <laughs> um, well, I can't really see in here. Are, are, so this type of, they look like they're all the same size? Actually, they're three different sizes. Um, so, yeah, I'll speak a little bit about my 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 relationship with that part of the process. 
Um, when I first began, I used a drill bit that was uh, three quarters of an inch because that's what was suggested. Um, I've now acquired a few different sizes and I use them. The, um, the finger holes, my, um, what I learned over the, the beginning year or two of making flutes was that the diameter of the holes in relationship to the length of the bore affects the tuning. Oh, that was like mind boggling at first. And how I learned that was, as I mentioned, I burned finger holes in the flute. Um, I experimented with placement, with numbers of holes. Some of my early flutes had 12 or 14 holes in them. I would just plug them with corks or something. Um, if I didn't hear the relationship between the, you know, the, the holes that were already in there that was pleasing to me, I would just plug one and put a new hole somewhere else. One of the things that really stood out was after I burned the holes and I would, I would play the flute and listen, and then I would think, oh, there's charcoal, there's the burnt material inside, I should clean that out. And when I did, I realized that I was changing the pitch of that, of that note. So that began a, a purposeful um, uh, desire, we'll say, to, um, yeah, how can I say that differently? Um, You stumped me here because, so so in the beginning, as I mentioned, the holes were random. Um, even the sizes of the holes were just kind of arbitrary. And over the course of experimenting, um, the the relationship, the different size holes. I have a small at the top, a large and a medium hole, and then a large, medium, and a small hole at the bottom. Um, that came. Kind of as a mistake, you know, that, that um, it wasn't intentional in the beginning. But once I put those holes in there in, in that way, I, I realized that it made a pleasing sound to me. I don't know, that, that's probably not making sense. The, the approach, at least my approach to building flutes has been um, non-intellectual. I, I didn't have someone to ask questions to, so it was all kind of trial and error. And once I came up with this recipe, I kind of stuck with it. Um, even on this, this larger flute, um, even though the holes are much bigger, the bore is much bigger, this is a, an inch and a quarter bore, but the relationship between the holes and the diameter and the length of the bore is the same as it is on this little one. Um, what is that relationship? I heard, I heard. So, what is that relationship? <sighs> what is that relationship? So, the longer and wider, the bigger the hole? Yes. Um, yeah, so because this is not uh, an intellectual endeavor okay, for me, I, I, okay. I, I'll just have to explain it to you the best way sure, that I can. Sure, sure. So, yes, the longer the bore, the wider the bore, either the finger holes have to be proportionately. Uh, uh, size, large, um, or they can, I'll say it this way, where they're located on the bore affects the, the voice, the pitch of them. So as they go lower on the bore, the holes have to get much larger. As they go higher on the bore, the holes have to be smaller. So this group of holes that I have here, if I had raised it up on the, uh, on the bore some, they would be closer in um, distance, would be closer to each other, and the size of them would be smaller. And the, the opposite is true. If they were lower on the board, then the holes would be much larger, and they would need to be spaced out a little bit more. Do you base them on keys? Do, you, do, or do they play in a particular key? Or do oh, they... absolutely they play in a particular key. But what key that is, I have no <laughs> clue. <laughs> and, but I mean, the relationships are... And are... my reason for not having a clue is key is a European concept. Yes, yes, yes. And these are much older on this yes. continent than that way of thinking about music. Mm -hmm. And my, um, my desire has, to, has been to remain consistent with how we indigenous people think about music. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's why I don't think about So key. are they based in some modality of some kind? Or that I, I'm not have... sure what that is. <laughs> but explain it to me. No, no, you went there. You were playing. Are you playing melodies that are traditional? Yes. So they 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 are based in 
a body of work that comes out of of oral traditions of passing along i really love your question and here's where you don't get to talk because i'm going to talk for an hour i i think it's a really great question that you're asking and that's the question about tradition what tradition is i think um some of the music that i play does come out of oral tradition some of them are very old old songs but the vast majority of the music that i play are actually songs that i've composed or created um and and those songs arise from my relationship to this earth and sky and um how it is that i view life um and my suspicion uh, and uh, i'll repeat myself saying that i think it's a really important question that you ask because tradition is oftentimes thought of as a historical approach to right. something and it's not necessarily that it, uh, history is important to consider in our living today so and that's my approach with the with the music that i compose or that i create composing yeah, right, right. seems odd um in terms of this conversation um so the songs that i play they're songs they're repeatable songs they're not improv improvisations or anything like that and my hope is that 100 or 200 or 500 years from now people will be playing the songs that i've created uh, people already do mm -hmm. um but i think of uh you know that place and time where the the songs that we think of as traditional that come from a historical place i think uh, about the person who created it you know someone sat with a flute or a, a bassoon or a, a viola and created a piece of music that then became popular and appreciated and so it was carried forward and so i think of of my music in that in that regard you know mm -hmm. um, I, I love your question though thank you for asking that it's an important question i do have two questions that popped up on chat um so the first one let me get back to it can I ask real quick, um, when you say that you want it to be 200 or 300 years in the future, is there a particular way that you want that to be carried forward? Is it just through people like hearing it by ear and then playing yeah. it and just kind of learning it by passing it on and on? I have CDs. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe one will be in a space capsule or a time capsule or something. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the folks who do, there are a number of folks who... Um, who do play some of the songs that I've created, and they've learned them just from listening. Um, yeah, so I mean that's that's one way. Do you know. have a preference? Or no, I, I don't. I, I really don't. I'm I'm grateful that people have enough interest in the things that I do with my with my music, and even even the instruments that I build. Um, they have enough interest to to want to you know learn about it. And, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask my two from Zoom. All right kind of a two-part question and then another question. So Nia would like to know what woods are the bassoons made of? Um, <laughs> mostly maple, mostly figured maple, but um, also various fruit woods, so pear wood and cherry wood, okay. and even boxwood. Um, some harder woods have been used, like palisander, but most mostly figured maple. Okay. Yeah. And then she also asked about the evolution of the metal connector to the reed. She said she doesn't know what it's called, but... <laughs> um, so um, the vocal. <laughs> and I also did not know what it was called. Um, yeah, so, so right, right from the start, there are all of the all bassoons or dulcians had vocals, that little metal tube. And the evolution, it was always a tapered tube, so um, as much as there's really big difference between two reeds like the vocal has a huge 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 um, effect on the sound of the instrument so not only does the vocal have to be sort of like fit to the instrument because of like whatever range it has um, but you can have several vocal models that will play on an instrument and give you a, a different a different feel and a different sound yeah and, the, and yeah and so the vocals are really made from a piece of flat stock um, and then it's it's shaped into a tube and hammered over mandrels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leslie, um, 
the bogle, you've talked about its function. Um, was it intended in the beginning to to extend the reach of the instrument? You know, on some of the big bass flutes that people are making, this, this kind of flute, they're building extensions of the mouthpiece so that they can physically play it. You, you needed something to stick a reed on. <laughs> that, that yeah. was really okay. so, so that was uh, and because of you know so so depending on the size of the instrument of course some vocals can be really really short um, gotcha. and they always or if you think of like higher inch instruments like oboes or rhythmores they have they have a staple that's called a staple but it's same really, function it, it's same function gotcha. it's, it's just something something that can connect the bottom of a reed to the beginning of the bore of an instrument. So is but, it the material that affects how the vocal affects the instrument, or is it the shape? It's or everything. It's, it's everything. Good. And because they're they're especially if they're handmade, which which um, most vocals still are. I mean, it's it, there's a huge amount of hammering, a huge amount. Of, <laughs> so you you have to get into the mood. A huge amount of hammering with a lot of annealing, um, uh, because uh, metal work hardens, so you have to constantly heat it. Um, and there's just absolutely no way you can hammer two pieces of metal exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So um, there's going there's going to be just by by the way you make it like just varying degrees of density throughout, and um, so that contributes to it. How conform is it to the mandrel? Um, you know, will contribute to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then the bend will con contribute to it. Yeah. So you can make a batch of vocals. And by a batch, I mean like five, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and exactly the same model, exactly the same length, exactly the same, and they will be five different sounding vocals. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was really interesting that both of your lives of working with the instruments came out of the death of them, where you both pulled them apart. Both of you. <laughs> We couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> I mean, I, get, I, I mean, it's just interesting. Just like the, the, when you talked about the process of the tone holes and and um, um, I couldn't hold the conversation. Measuring or not measuring, and then ultimately you really just have this instrument in front of you that you have to try and figure out how to make play. I mean, I don't know actually how much to how much work you do after you do the tone holes because a, yeah, a lot. Yeah, so a lot. I I do have I, a question for you though. Besides just mentioning okay. the death of the instrument, the life that came out of it. Um, the word sham, do you know the etymology of it, Leslie? I don't actually. Uh, I, I wondered if it had anything to do with connecting to source and shaman, and I wondered about the ritual aspect of the instrument and healing. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I, that's interesting. But, but again, like they're, they're called shanais in a lot, I mean, from Persia all the way to. India and Zornas in Turkey and I think Shanai is even in North Africa. So I, I, I always thought like, like that was sort of like some you know, but I, otherwise I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But I always, just going sort of back to tone holes for a moment, it's like I always under, nah, there's some, some tone holes I don't under drill anymore. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about like pieces of cork or tape, I mean, I'll still, I'm still experimenting. Oh, yeah. I'm, st I'm still playing around. Um, and you make holes smaller by putting in a little bit of wax and, mm -hmm. you know, and an instrument that's actually an instrument that I'm still like kind of trying to figure out. Because um, every, every, um, so er, it, your, your bore is basically cylindrical. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my, my, since the bore is conical, for the bassoon is I have to go in with with the drill and then I have to open it up a reamer. with with reamers and and every model so to speak has its own set of reamers um, that give the final dimension of the instrument the final starting dimension of the instrument mm -hmm. but then as you play it um, there are sometimes adjustments you have to make because um, for, for for tuning reasons but the interesting thing for me with the tuning is that I actually don't touch the instrument when it's finished for at least a week of playing, because it, I need it, it needs to, to settle. It needs to find out where it wants to be, yeah. like it needs to settle. Mm -hmm. and we, we have so many things in terms yeah, of our yeah. approach in common. Yeah. It's, it, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked so, a, about undercutting the holes, and part of that came um, a, a, as a result of 
when I learned that cleaning the charcoal mm. debris out of the holes affected the sound, I thought, well, what happens if I cut? I have a little concave knife. Uh, the blade is concave, and I use that to undercut the holes. And now I, um, every now and then, when I, I put the tone holes in the flute, I expect that it's not going to be in tune the way that I want it to be. And then every now and then something surprises me, and it's like, it's perfect. And I think, I should just leave it. No, I can't just leave it. <laughs> I, and, and so I work on it, and then of course, I regret that, and I think I should have just left it. But there's something that I learned from that experience, you know, which is I should have just left it. <laughs> do you yeah. find? Do you find? Um, I mean, this is within. There's there's a, there's a limit to this. But do you find that because it's like a whole, because it's a balance, so you might have maybe messed something up a little bit here, but there's a way sometimes of making an adjustment. <laughs> Here that will put the whole thing back into totally. It. Yeah, so of that's course. like yeah. yeah. It's it's yeah. I, the process. I, I think that in one way or another, we've both spoken to this here and in our uh, meeting at Rooster Brother. Um, the process of building, I can say for me, is is not uh, intellectual, which I've implied already. I've, I've mentioned that it's kind of living. It's a it's a it's a it um, it's, uh, it's my it's new each time. That that's yeah. how I think about it. It's a new, you know. No matter how many times I build a flute, each flute is new. It's it's not routine. Um, and um, and I generally build one flute at a time. Um, and, and there's there's a lot of reason for that, but. Um, but, so when that one's finished, and, and like Leslie, I, I, I'll get a flute to a certain point and then it sits in my shop for four or five days uh, after I oil it. I use a walnut oil on my flutes as a finish. Um, and I'll go back and uh, make whatever adjustments that need to be made. Most oftentimes it's very little, sometimes it's dramatic, and then sometimes it, it's beyond the realm of my understanding. <laughs> I, I made a flute last year, or two years ago, and for all intents and purposes, it should have just been, you know, perfect. It didn't play at all after I oiled it. Yeah. It just, it just oh. wouldn't play. I mean, at all. It just went. Yeah. Um, so it, it sits in my shop right now until I learn why. <laughs> so, so it's a living, um, as I said, ever-changing new process <clears throat> each time I, I approach yeah. it. And, and, and there's a little bit of almost like a dialogue in it. Yes. It's like it's like living, and there's like this dialogue, um, because they're, they're, because you're also just trying to figure out what it needs. Yeah. You're, so so you're you're trying to have it tell you. Absolutely. What, <laughs> what, what, um, what it's like you're in my head saying all of this <laughs> because this is this is it. My I in my shop. Part of the reason why I work on one flute at a time is that I don't ever <coughs> want to force the piece of wood to be something that it doesn't want to be. Um, and sometimes, you know, I might have a piece of wood this big and, um, and, and it takes a while for me to see where the flute is in that piece of wood that big. Um, um, and once I see it, then, you know, I try to listen to it when I'm working. And that's the beauty for me of hand tools is that it allows a, a, an intimate relationship between the tool and the wood and myself. And I, I love that about using hand tools with my, with my flute making. I'm learning more about that relationship with the electric tools that I use. It's mostly a lathe um, that I use, but you know, for 30 plus, 31 plus years, it's been just these old rusty hand tools, and that relationship is uh, well established. Um, but yeah, L Leslie and I met at the Boston Early Music Festival. I, maybe, yeah. maybe you're not aware of that, um, or maybe you are. <laughs> uh, I was an exhibitor at the Boston Early Music Festival. Um, may have been one of the first non-European instrument makers to exhibit their instruments there. And I, I went um, primarily to meet people like Leslie. I, I, I love early music. Um, it's what I listen to and, you know, in the back of my head I have this fantasy of, of learning how to play uh, early music in one. This is early music too, by the way. I would say so. But yeah. early, Euro <laughs> early European music, I should say, to, to play one of these or maybe a, an oboe or a flute, you know. Um, 
But that's that's where Leslie and I met, and I'm I'm really grateful that we did. In fact, we parked behind each other. Yes, we like did. Main plate. Main plate. And then we all both in Hancock County. It was like. Yeah. yeah. It was how long ago was that? Like 2015, I think. Was it? Was it was that. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say I love the way you're talking about how the instrument changes you. And this relationship that you're talking about mm -hmm. that's just ongoing and keeps moving and has this uh, commitment mm -hmm. and formality and also flow, like liquid element. And I'm wondering, because you talked some about this, but Leslie, how has the bassoon changed you and changed your playing? Because you now play improvisational, experimental music. Sure. You don't play early music in that sense that you were talking about right, before. Right. So what happened? Did the bassoon call out to you and say, <laughs> get over here? Or how well, did it's, it's, the, 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 it's been a long time for that, too. That I've, I've, um, Well, I mean, for a long time, I was doing both Baroque music and free improv. And, 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 um, and then at some point, I, I stopped doing orchestra. Um, work because there are people who really do it and I you know like when you're younger you're like okay you, you, you haven't touched your instrument in like four months and yes somebody wants you to play in like two weeks I'm like yeah I'll do that and at some point you're like oh yeah there are people who kind of just do this all right. the time. <laughs> right. not that I ever seriously messed up but <laughs> um, well yeah I mean so so like it's it's like so part of part of trying to find out what an instrument wants from you is like getting inside of the sound. And that's certainly where I come from in my, and, and maybe I'll give a teeny demonstration on, of uh, multiphonics, which is just like what opened up for me. Um, you know, it, they've been around for a while. This is sort of like called extended techniques on, on wind instruments is when instead of you know, playing your, your scale of notes, um, you can actually with sometimes false fingerings, but sometimes true fingerings and just changing your embouchure um, um, pull out a single note into this it's hard to say it's, I don't want to call it a chord because it's more like this texture and that's all about trying to that that comes from trying to find inside of the instrument like what this instrument can can um, it's, it's very it's, it's a little hard to explain it's like what the instrument can possibly give you beyond, um, and, and it, it, it goes hand in hand with tuning, because we, we think of tuning as this really static thing, and tuning is not a static thing. Um, it's like, you know, harmonics of any given note are not actually perfectly in tune with each other. So for me, I'm sorry, I'm like a little bit all over the place, but there's also this connection of tone and pitch and how they cross over. So, so with the Baroque bassoons, like, you know, one, one, the great appeal was not just the music, but once I really started getting into them, is that in any given period, any given town, you would have like two or three bassoon makers and they would all sound different. Like any given period, you would have bassoons. We, we, we've, we've gone much more towards like a, a homogenous way of thinking of any given instrument. Like a sax sounds like a sax. At one point, you know, you had a sax that was a German sax or a French sax or American sax and you could hear the difference. But more and more, we've gotten to the place where um, instruments are built in a way that they, they sound um, much more alike. And, and this is an aesthetic, this is an aesthetic um, decision. I don't believe it's like, a natural course of things. <laughs> I think, I think this was. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a very, just a very quick example of like what it means like to get inside of, and and this is where it's like linked to trying to, um, even when I'm tuning a baroque bassoon, like trying to see okay, what does that instrument want to give me? It's just like really finding inside of it where, where it centers its tone and where where I can stretch it and where, um, and that you know on a modern bassoon, uh, which has this really tight focused. Um, tonal a scale, um, not as broad as like the early instruments, so a, a plain scale. So notes are just really very, very, very centered. But what happens when you start like just playing into that? Um, and, and just a couple of very, very short examples is. Um, Just open. 
opens up a whole palette, like just really a whole world of, it, of its own. And, and the interesting thing um, for me in it is that, um, yeah, I mean, there's something like right when you attack a note, when you play a note, and you just want that note to play, and you, you want it to speak, and, and you know how to control that and, and where to, to place it. There's something about playing around when you're inside of the sound, it will start directing you. And because it'll be a little bit different each time you do it. So you kind of have to, you play with it, and actually playing with it in, in a corner and playing with it in the middle of a room and playing with it in another room will actually um, affect the way um, it actually sounds and, right. and affect the different things you can do with it. So I, I mean, I don't know, there's, there's some direct link between um, tuning a Baroque bassoon and multiphonics. <laughs> and, and discovering multiphonics and, and the extent of them on the instrument. So I have another question from Zoom. This is from Judith, and she says, hi, Hawk. Um, and she says, there's a full message, and I want to read right now. Do you have a particular sound in mind as you start making a new flute, or does it reveal itself to you as it emerges? The latter. It reveals itself to me as I'm as I'm making it. Yeah. Okay. So could I ask? Um, it it seems like uh, Leslie brought up this really interesting idea that there would be these these like regional differences, like Germany, France, American instruments all sounding different, um, and that those would be more distinct potentially than even just like two different distinct instrument makers in a town. Um, could you both talk a little bit about how you think that your instrument making may like influence other contemporary or future instrument makers around you? Uh, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with um, my, my flutes. Let, let me take one apart so you can, so I can point it out to you. Um, Typically, the flutes that I make, the, the mid-range flutes that I make, use a round sound mechanism, which is uh, uh, considerably different than the vast majority of flute makers uh, uh, today. Um, uh, many of the flute makers today are using either rectangular or square sound holes. Um, I use round because, remember that guy Steve at the Hulls Cove Tool Barn? <laughs> He gave me a round file, and I thought <laughs> that will work perfect for making this sound mechanism. And um, and when I made the first, um, you know, the first few flutes, however many I don't remember, um, utilizing that that round um, file, they sounded okay. And so I continued to make them. Um, and as as a result, as I mentioned already, um, it was kind of unique in the sense that the, the rest of the flute makers in the flute making world, and I'll have to say that the vast majority of flute makers today uh, of this kind of flute aren't native people, but even those who are use rectangular sound holes, I mean, uh, yeah, sound mechanism. Interestingly enough, um, in, I don't know when, but in recent times, um, an old flute was discovered, hmm, I think it was discovered in the early 1900s, so that's you know relatively recent. Um, it's described as the uh, the oldest uh, example of native flute. Uh, it's about a thousand years old, and its sound holes are round, just like the ones that I make. So you know, I, I like to say that I must have like spiritually connected with something, but really I just got lucky. <laughs> um, uh, the flute's voice um, is. Uh, considerably different than the ones using rectangular sound holes. And um, at the Boston Early Music Festival, I, I talked with um, uh, uh, a flute maker, um, Boaz. This is Boaz Barron. He makes really incredibly beautiful flutes. And he, he drew a comparison between the uh, Baroque and some of the other early flutes instruments, they having small um, embouchure holes, I guess you'd call them, mouthpiece holes, small finger holes, um, and the sound that the flute produced as a result of that, um, th those tone holes and, and uh, sound holes, 
compared to a more modern classical flute with a larger, maybe more rectangular kind of hole and larger finger holes. Um, so in, in the flute world, this flute world, my flutes kind of stand out in the sense that their voices are uh, a little bit different. Not better, not worse, just different. There are some flute makers today who are now kind of experimenting using round sound holes, small finger holes, and uh, relationships in terms of bore and finger hole placement, like, like what I do. So I think that you know, my work is kind of um, is beginning to be seen as credible. <laughs> and, uh, um, it seems, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll smile too and say, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because, as I mentioned, the vast majority of flute makers in the, in the world, and they're all over the world now. When I started 31 plus years ago, there were only a handful of us um, who were doing it. And um, the vast majority have uh, approached flute making in a, in a vastly different way than than I do and other traditional flute makers, and yet that's now seen as the, the valid way. And it, it only recently, only in the last couple of years, have people begun to actually look at um, a, a more historically accurate way of building, and not just building, but relating to the process of building and playing this, this instrument. It's only been recent, you know, in the last couple of years. So, yeah. I can't remember what the question was, but, how, but I had um, some thoughts of what you were saying, but yeah. How, how your personal discoveries and journey in instrument making may influence your contemporaries, or how you have been influenced by your contemporaries potentially as well, and how that might affect future... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I have an answer about... Um, I mean, I have, I mean, you know, in, in slightly different worlds, like in my performing world, I have colleagues, and I know that they've, I definitely had some influence, but I've also been influenced by them in the making world. I mean, it's interesting, just when you talk about um, credibility or not, or, or <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, 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 so I, measure instruments. I have to measure instruments to be able to make tools um, because I have to base my tools on something and when I'm making the tools I'm measuring, the, you know, I'm using measurements, but there's a little bit of divining involved, you know, like, <laughs> so, so I can't really say that I really have a scientific approach um, at all either, but I, I I don't know, this may be a very, very small side. So in, in, in this, um, in a dulcian, so the, speaking of spacing of tone holes, and um, I wonder if this is one that was done. Yeah, this is, this is an example of, of, of what I'm talking So yeah, so what, you know, there's, there's this big world that decides things are a certain way, and there's like people who are in this world, whatever the world is, and this is the way it is, and because this is the way it was done. And so, I mean, so, so this instrument is actually a, a, based on a Spanish um, instrument, probably from about um, 1640 or so. But I'm, I'm, I, I had the chance to actually see a lot of these instruments that were contemporary um, with, with this bass instrument. So it's not really one instrument, it's a couple of instruments. And one thing I, start, I noticed in several of them was how small this tone hole is, how small this tone hole is, and the large, relatively large space between these two fingers, and how small this tone hole was. And not to get into like the scale of the instrument um, too much, but th those to me indicated that this had to be a full, this had to be, um, sorry, this had to be a half step, which would have put this instrument totally into a modal world, which no fingering chart existed with this kind of fingering on it. And I, I, I was working with a colleague on this and we were both, we, were, we both noticed this. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, let me just try doing that on, on one. And sure enough, it makes this like modal scale with like a completely different. And 
Five years later, this colleague of mine found a fingering chart that showed that fingering. So, and, you know, and, and there was like, you know, in, in, the, in the great big buzz world of like, you know, Dulcian, Thomas <laughs> you know, this was, this was like when we first started talking about, they were like, you know, there's no way, like it makes no sense. It's like, you know, everything else is this way. Why is this this way? So two things happen. So A, it gets proved um, that actually what we were seeing and observing and not putting on it what we, we think is it is, what we were seeing and observing wasn't only true, but it actually made you question the other instruments that didn't have it. Because like because it's true. And then you would see that, oh, this, this does appear in other instruments, in Shams, actually. Um, so I don't know if that was like a side. But yeah, so like so I think I think Hawk and I kind of share like we yeah, our, our relationship is with this instrument regardless of what a norm might be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we, we, we uh, I think we both share, like, it's, it's back to that, it's like the instrument tells you what it, what it wants and what it needs, <coughs> um, as opposed to trying to force the instrument into, yeah. into something else. Uh, like how you said how a norm, which implies that there's more than one norm. Right. There are many norms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Do you make both, a couple of questions, do you make both diatonic and pentatonic instruments? I do. Yeah. yeah. And the, what's the bulk of the sales? What, what sells the most? What do most people buy? Um, uh, what sells the most at this point in time are the ones um, thought of as pentatonic. Um, the pentatonic uh, flute so about 15 or so years ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, um, the term really wasn't even considered with this instrument, you know, pentatonic. Um, one of the flute makers who makes really fabulous flutes, uh, his name is uh, Michael Graham Allen, or Ty the Old Man is his uh, musical name. He began using that term with the flutes that he made. Uh, and uh, so it kind of caught on and became really popular. Uh, and that was the goal that most flute makers had, which was to, to make flutes that were pentatonic. Um, it's, also, it's also interesting uh, that most people credit this person, Michael Graham Allen, with, um, with applying the pentatonic scale to this instrument. Um, uh, but as I mentioned, he, he simply made it popular about 15 or 18 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty old uh, way of tuning this flute. Um, recently, in recent years, I think maybe the last three years or four years, there's been more of an interest in the diatonic flutes. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really sure where that's coming from, why it's growing, although I can tell you, if you're ever on Facebook, there's a group called the Indigenous Flute Group that myself and a couple of other people started to um, expose people um, to that way of tuning and thinking and playing about, about the flute. Um, and so there's, there's been uh, surprisingly more interest in that group and consequently in that way of making and playing uh, you know, the flute itself. So I think that it's, it's gaining more popularity as we go on, slow but, but there. Um, I, I can... I'll show you one of the ones. Um, let's see. This this one is kind of uh, pentatonic. Um, you can play the other scale. Um, and this one here. This one is, um, it has a, a, a piece of metal, I don't know if you can see it here, um, and it acts as the splitting edge or as the, the, the cutting edge of the sound hole. Um, this one is more diatonic-ish.
voice in the voice of it. Mark, is there a association or a tribe of you guys? Of us guys? Of, of Indian flute makers. Um, no, not not really. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Native people um, have used the flute for quite a long time. Uh, we continue to do so. There are different incarnations or different forms of it, depending on where you're at uh, geographically. Um, but there's not one particular group of, of Native flute people, if, if that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, right. I you know, inclusive word, associative. Like a society of some type or an yeah, organization? Yeah, like to the early music uh, instrument makers program. So, like, you guys would collaborate or um, um, assemble yeah. together for an event. There isn't. Um, there are flute events, flute festivals uh, uh, around the country um, that focus on this kind of instrument. Um, but they're not generally put together by um, Native people. Some of us get invited to go and play at them, but there's not like um, any, any event or gathering of, uh, of Native flute players, you know. There, there is, there's nothing like that. My, my last question, are any of them transverse flutes? Um, oh, gee, I should have brought one with me. So, no. Um, but, but um, some of them, uh, some of the older flutes that come particularly from the southwest are um, just hollow tubes and they're, they're uh, rim blown flutes. I might be able to, so let's make believe this is hollow. So they're, they're hollow tubes, so it's not quite a, a transverse flute. Um, I, I think you'd have to go further south, um, to maybe Central and South America, to find uh, traditionally transverse flutes. That's Alan, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, so, sure. it, behind the mask, I'm not always sure, but yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I've enjoyed this so much, and I don't want to keep this too long, but. I'm really intrigued with the idea of tuning, and I'm, you know, very familiar with European-based tuning, but I'm wondering, Hawk. Uh, is that Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see I'm you. I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering, you know, that these two completely different cultures, and each with a music, and a Two different norms, if you want to call it. But suppose you wanted to uh, specialize in ancient, or in your norm, the oldest songs you could have, the ones that have been handed down, that people knew, repeatable songs, not just. And I'm wondering, you know, like that thousand year old flute. Was, what was the tuning of that? Is it something we could describe? Would it be a, a recognizable pentatonic or diatonic? Or was it just a whole array of different pitches? And that would be exciting to think that there was a whole... You didn't even hear things in terms of whole steps and half steps. <clears throat> I, I, wish I, could, I, I wish I could tell you what that uh, thousand-year-old flute sounded like because it was actually only fragments of it that were found oh. um, so I'm not I'm not sure about the tuning of it yeah. um, the the flutes uh, in, a, in a very broad and general kind of sense were used in in two ways um, one was to replicate vocal songs so they were then um, so in that regard they were tuned in such a way that they would be able to replicate the, the song that was being sung. Right. Um, and then they were used, and again, very generally, for, for prayer. Um, and in, in that way, and this is how I, how I think of my flutes, um, with, the, with the intention of using it to express things that I'm, I'm feeling about creation, we'll say, prayer. Yeah. 
Yes. I'm hesitant to, I'll make a face while I say that. What's important to me is that um, the voices that come out of it adequately do the work that I need them to do. Sometimes that means that the voices are pleasing. Sometimes it means that they all work nicely, harmoniously together. Other times it means that they're not so much so. Um, and, and as an example, um, I, I was playing somewhere, uh, it was New Year's by the Bay, like 20 years ago, and um, I had just finished the flute. And I, I, I don't ever really bring brand new flutes with me to some place to play until I know what they're, what they're going to do, what their work is. But I felt compelled to do that. I was playing, and uh, through the piece of music that I was playing, there was a note that, that really made me tense. And so I stopped playing. And at the end of um, the, my presentation that evening, uh, a, a woman approached me, and she said, you know, there was a particular flute that you were playing, and every time you hit a note, and I said, oh, I, I know, it just made the tension. She said, no, I've had this back spasm, and every time you hit that note, I relax. So I gave her the flute. I figured that out for her because it didn't do it for me. Um, so you know those. I'm kind of almost forgetting what you initially asked. Me. No, that's but, uh, it's fine. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm right with you. Oh, good. Go. Yeah. But even when we think, well, I guess no, no. If we think of scales elsewhere, like we think of the twenty sevens. Scale, 27 note ragas, I think. Like, ragas have like a total 27 note. We think of like Persian scales, which have more. But even with like European music and the tuning we have, I mean, like the tuning we have now is just, it's relatively recent. Like, it's only a couple of, okay, it's 200 years old, mm -hmm. which is which is relatively recent. So when you, when just even saying like, you know, it's just like thinking of tones and, and semitones or, or, or thirds or whatever. But there's a lot of room where those, notes could land historically even in mm -hmm. in European music. I mean there were there were many, many apart from the fact that there were many different pitches in different towns depending on the organ of that town, depending <laughs> on but they somehow managed to play with each other. You know, they, they did manage to play with each other mm -hmm. because instruments were maybe a little bit more flexible for, for any number of reasons they managed to play with each other. Mm -hmm. And even within a given city you had several different pitches because you had the concert tone you had like you know that was like a, a tone above or a tone below um and then you know so 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 for fixed pitched instruments like organs or um you know harpsichords or something at the time you're limited by that because you have these like number of strings that have to be like tuned to each other right. but otherwise i mean there were so many tuning systems until equal time permit set the rule and that was all it was all about mostly about tuning your thirds like wanting perfect thirds um but just like you know it's, it's, it wasn't so rigid it wasn't just so rigid and so it wasn't just so rigid that's mm -hmm. all so like even as uh mm -hmm. even within western music um mm -hmm. tuning systems were mm -hmm. much broader and much more mm -hmm. flexible I think listening was more flexible too, right? Oh, well, it had to be because you didn't actually have a. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know what you mean. You meaning like you could tolerate things that weren't uh, in tune, or is that what you meaning? Or concepts of in tune and out of tune were more. Flexible. Concepts of in tune and out of tune were more flexible, but if you had concepts of tuning um, between two different tuning systems that you would argue over at the time, and the differences were like minimal it meant that you were able to hear it and like both everybody was able to hear it like if you had you know somebody who wanted to tune in, in, in such a such a temperament and somebody else who preferred this temperament and those differences are minute um I, that's where i don't really think our hearing was worse i think our hearing is i don't think i, I don't think worse. our no uh, my implication was not that our hearing was worse was it? It, it was it was more accepted it was more accepting, and it was. I think it was more than more accepting. I think it could. You could hear the difference. So in hearing the difference, you could like name the difference, right? Like if you could name the difference, you were able to hear the difference. Uh, I I I think the relative um, fixed pitch equal temperament system 
the demands of value, judgment of right or wrong that perhaps was right. less right. applied. Oh, thank you, thank you for, yeah, that was, that was, that I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. I agree, yeah. Yeah. Nate and I like to spar. <laughs> that wasn't nothing, Adam. I know it was, it was nothing. <laughs> yeah. Is there any conversation the two of you want to have each other with each other purely musically? Uh, that the English language doesn't handle. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, a, a, a good question. I, um, you know, for the majority of my flute life, my uh, playing has been solo. There's a lot of jokes in that, but uh, primarily, primarily because um, the instrument traditionally and historically was a solo instrument, and um, I think it's it's vitally important to remain um, to, to keep some connections with uh, tradition uh, for me. Um, and, and, you know, I dig my heels in a little bit with regard to that because there's such a, 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 a deviation from it nowadays. Um, having said that, oh, 14 years ago, I was invited uh, to England where I did some work with the uh, London Mozart players and uh, compose a piece of music and we played together. And honestly, uh, I was initially um, pretty hesitant to do that because of my need to stick with tradition and because I Googled them and learned that they were like this phenomenal group of musicians and I, and I, was, I was petrified. Um, and my wife and our daughter said, well, why don't you just do it? And, and when we leave England, if it was horrible, no one's ever going to speak about it, so they'll, they won't know at home. And I was like, yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, so we did. Uh, you know, we went and spent three weeks there, actually. Most of it wasn't music with them, but that's for another story. <laughs> but my time with them um, really affected me as a person. Not as a, I, I'm not a musician. I've never considered myself a musician and probably never will. Um, but... Uh, my experience with them really had a great impact on me as a human being. Um, and I left there, one, thinking about the possibilities of doing music with other musicians. Um, Yo-Yo Ma and a few of us did some work this past summer uh, at Scudic Point, uh, and he and I have continued to be in discussion about doing more music together. Uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled about that potential. Um, so... You know, there's there's that part of it, but but she really knows what she's doing too, <laughs> and that kind of unnerves me. So I think you know what you're doing too. Yeah. You know, for modulo different ways of knowing. I, you know, I, I think it's pretty crazy what you do. Thank you. And I don't really know what I'm doing at all. <laughs> me either. So. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. We'll, uh, no, I mean, we'll do something together maybe someday. Yeah. Leslie, what, what are you currently making for your bertini? I don't really... Are, are you making that one, the bertini? Cur you, I mean, what am I... Oh, no, no, no. So this one is actually a factory-made modern bassoon. Okay. Um, but all the others I've made. Okay. And so you don't make one for... I make one with 16 keys, which I'm actually currently making. Do you make the keys yourself? Yeah, I make the keys. Oh, so do you craft them? No, they're cut from, from sheet metal and, and shaped and soldered and oh, filed. Yeah. And, um, and the, is, it, is the bassoon tuned with the, um, what's it called? The vocal? The vocal. Is, that, is it tunable? Um, infinitesimally. Um, it's, so you it's, don't fly the vocal. Right no, you do, you do. Oh, it can yeah. it can make a difference. But the 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 every you know it's it's a whole system. So 
when you when you um, pull your vocal out or push it in, like you have a little bit of room without having to then make other adjustments because it's going to affect the notes that are closest to where you're lengthening. Um, so your 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 notes that are closest to the vocal will go up in pitch much quicker than the notes that are lower down in the vocal. So you 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 have a very small range of being able to. Um, Tune a full instrument just by by doing that. It'll mess up the scale. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, but you know, it's it's incredibly flexible instrument um, because of the reed. So, um, yeah, you sit with it for a little while, and you re you figure out okay, like okay, so I have to bring my bass up more than I have to bring you know. So it's possible, and and sometimes you have to do that. Um, you do you do have a range of different lengths of vocals for, but we're talking um, kind of really small differences in tuning. For the amount that you stick it in, is there a length of feed that's standard, or do you do you do longer or shorter, and does that affect the sound? It does affect the sound. So there, there, there is a you know how how far it's inserted. You mean? Mm -hmm. um, yes, there's a set length that normally you insert it in, but you do have a little bit of room to play. But I'm I'm talking like an eighth of an inch maybe a quarter of an inch at the most. But that's going to, as I said, that's going to start affecting like your full scale. Okay, um, so not like the trumpet where you have a, a thing that you can really... No, no. And, and not even on a trumpet, I think you even have a few of those, right? Right. Like, yeah, right. So, I mean, you can, you can um, um, pull out joints elsewhere, too. So, you, so if you're really needing to, like, you know, Basically, the direction is to go flatter. If you're really needing to go much flatter, then you can start to pull out everything, um, you know, incrementally on the instrument. Um, and, and then, you know, a huge amount of tuning is in the reed. You know, once your instrument is where it's supposed to be, then, then it's like your reed. So it's a physical. Oh, and, and have the, your length of it, your... your uh, yeah, so you can right, you can shorten it. And, and, uh, do you do you carry sets of reeds for each instrument, depending on what the voicing mm -hmm. needs to be or you want it to be? Yeah, yeah. I mean each each instrument will have its own. Yeah. 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 Um, and can have you know as a shovel many many reeds that just give you a different tone. Right. Yeah. Uh, depending on on what it is you you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This could be another event, but I'm wondering for both of you, these creations that you've made, um, what happens when it goes to another person? And what's the continuation connection, if or not? <coughs> I'm almost happy, always happy to see an instrument go to someone. Like it's a good feeling that this instrument is going to have a life of its own. Every once in a while, there's one that I really wish I could hang on to longer. <laughs> <laughs> so what stops you? Uh, rent. Oh yeah. <laughs> Food. And, and, and a promise. And, 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 and a promise. You know, <laughs> like I can't go back on my. You know, I like your instrument too much and. Keeping it, I'll make you another. It doesn't quite work. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, and and I do see them back. I do see them. Yeah. The person and the instrument. Sometimes never the person, depending on where they are. Okay. Yeah. But often the person with the instrument. And of course, you know, my that's sort of one big difference. My move from New York City to Maine. Um, you know, people used to go through the city all the time on tours or whatever, so I would see a lot more of my customers that, you know, would have would land in the city for a few days. And, and here it means that they get to spend three days with me instead of just, like, an afternoon. But, um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's not as common. And you, what, how do you feel about your instruments in the world? Oh, I love the fact that they're in the world. Um, I, I have uh, flutes all over the world, and I um, make the effort, I was going to say I make the effort to stay in touch with people who have my flutes, but actually what I do is encourage them to stay in touch with me. Um, it's, it's easier, and, um, you know, I do so, uh, I, think it's, I think it's important uh, in the sense that 
I like to know that they're being cared for in a way that will um, keep them healthy and also uh, allow the person who has them to have the relationship with it that they hoped in the beginning. There have been a few occasions, I mentioned I use walnut oil uh, as a finish on my flutes and I do so because it's edible uh, for the most part, unless somebody has uh, severe allergies to, uh, to nut oil or you know to that type of oil, then it's safe and it's edible. Um, it requires that the flute is oiled uh, at least twice a year. Uh, not much more than that, but, but twice a year. Um, and there are certain steps in terms of caring for the flute. And once a person um, knows what those steps are and they do it, then the flute will stay healthy and they'll love playing the flute. But I have met a few, um, or I've known a, a few folks over the years who've, um, you know, written to me or called me and said, you know, the flute just doesn't sound the way it did when I bought it from you 15 or 18 or 20 years ago. And the first question is, well, is usually, what are you doing to take care of it? And uh, oftentimes it's um, clear that they haven't oiled it. It's clear that the procedures that I've suggested um, haven't been followed. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's good when they contact me and then I can encourage them to do what it is that I you know, think is necessary. So. I have a question from the Zoom. This is from Jim. He said, uh, do you have many, this is for both of you, do you have many requests from people wanting to apprentice? And how do you manage that? I haven't had too many. I've had an, um, yeah, when I was in the city, I had a couple people here and there. And I've recently, I haven't, um, I, I, I um, yeah. I can't have an answer to that. I haven't. I haven't really sought it or encouraged it, just because I. Um, I would take it. I would take the responsibility pretty seriously, um, and uh, I work in somewhat a chaotic. I, I couldn't work the way I work anymore. Like I would have to. Um, it would be a big. It would be a big change for me. So I haven't really sought it. Um, yeah, and how I structure my day and how I structure my work. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I've done quite a few flute making workshops. Uh, as far as having someone apprentice with me, um, I, I, yeah, it, it hasn't it hasn't happened yet. Jim, did you say? Yes. It hasn't yes. happened yet, um, and I think in part. Uh, my thinking about flute making and having an apprentice, we would probably spend, I don't know what length of time, but a decent amount of time walking in the woods, um, being outside, listening to birds, going to the ocean and listening to the, you know, to what happens at the ocean, the waves and the wind. Um, and all of that uh, it, for me is an important part of, of the flute making process. Um, it would require learning about the woods and the, the the, the trees specifically, and what lives in and around those trees, and how um, taking the wood impacts its life. Um, it's a it would be a very long apprenticeship, and it seems that people nowadays don't have time for that. Um, I did have one um, one lady who spent maybe three days or four days in my workshop with me, um, and uh, and she did really great. She went on to um, uh, to Pennsylvania, and she worked in some museum, working with uh, with other instruments as well. But that was probably the longest one on one time I've had with uh, someone who was interested in the flutes. Yeah. I'd, I'd love for that to happen, but as I said, it seems that people don't have time for it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. If anybody has any more questions, now would be the time to ask. You, is this the first time you collaborated? Is this uh, the first time you collaborated? No, no. Actually, Maybe we, we did, did at it. Rooster Brother a, a few <laughs> weeks ago when we <laughs> yes, sat in that I coffee. Don't a discussion. I mean, a presentation, a public presentation. Yes. 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 This is the first time. Yes. yes. You should take it on the road. You can <laughs> be rich doing this. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, filthy maybe, right? In many ways, monetarily, maybe not. But I, I, you know, I have to say that when um, Leslie invited me to um, to be a part of this, uh, I, particularly after knowing a little bit more about her her thinking and relationship to the process, I thought, you know, we're, we're approaching our, our instrument making, our relationship, in, in kind of uh, from, the same, from the same place. And it was, um, I, I loved the idea of being able to do this, to share this time, and to talk about what inspires us and our, you know, the, the physical approaches and not so physical approaches to what, what it is that we do and, and why we do it. And, and interestingly, I don't find the same thinking with a lot of the flute folks. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes it's just strictly intellectual. Um, not to say that it's not there, but a, a vast majority is strictly intellectual. And, um, and I, I'm, <laughs> no, you know, I love the fact that, um, that there's so many things in terms of our process and our thinking about the process that, that we share, that we have in common. Yeah. So, yeah, let's go on the road, yeah. Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll still, yeah, the, yes, this is, and, and, and we were, you know, when we both arrived, both of us were like, we were still trying to figure out, like, do you speak first a little bit? So, so we, didn't, we didn't really have a script either. Yeah. No. So, but, um, yeah, we knew. We, so in a, we in a great way, it was just like how we make flutes, kind of right. organic, right. natural <laughs> progression and evolution, which we're, is great. <laughs> We also discovered that, that uh, given a chance, we, we have no trouble just talking to. <laughs> it's, it's more difficult to not. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been a real pleasure. It has been. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you guys so much for speaking.